don't believe that balance exists. I believe it's wholeness. I'm whole to begin with, but I I have work to do. Wholeness to me is being able to be your own bridge to your heart, through your heart. This is the 100th episode of the Wholeness Network podcast, and I'm so excited. It has been an amazing adventure starting this podcast and meeting extra amazing people. So I wanted to take this opportunity to just kind of talk about the background of the Wholeness Network and the podcast and what that's been like and just kind of reminisce for a few minutes. So back in 2016, uh, I remember being in bed and waking up in the middle of the night with this aha moment about starting a podcast. I knew hardly anything about it. I didn't know very many podcasts at that time. It was kind of not as popular as it is now. And I remember taking some notes and I remember thinking it'd be great to interview people. And I wanted to call it something like two by four or something like that. And it was like, what is the thing in your life that hit you over the head like a two by four and woke you up or shifted who you are or made you look at things differently in your life or who I would say now, what was the thing that catapulted you to discovering wholeness, to understanding the parts of you that needed to improve, embracing the things that you wanted to not necessarily embrace, those kind of things. That's the idea of wholeness. So then fast forward to February 1st of 2018. We had talked a few months before, but Robin Johnson and I decided we were going to start the Wholeness Network on February 1st, 2018. And we didn't even know exactly what we were going to do, but I showed up and on my on my way there, it was I was driving to her house and I just thought of this song and I thought, we're going to play this song and we're going to dance. And so that's how we began. We turned on the song and we just danced and we could feel the excitement in the air that this was going to be something new. This was going to be something exciting. And, you know, it's so funny because back then, one of the biggest challenges we had was the word wholeness. It was not commonly used. People didn't understand what it was when we would say we are from the Wholeness Network. Oh, I really like homeless. They would say, I really appreciate people helping homeless people. We would get that all the time. People did not understand the concept of wholeness or what that meant. So, We And we didn't even know, like Robin had gotten the name as she was looking for another business that she was starting and just thought, hey, I might as well get that URL. So she had the URL and and I had some of the ideas and and the ability to do some things on the back end. So we joined forces and, and just moved forward. And I remember even looking up, you know, Googling the word wholeness and seeing how wow, that's exactly the the vision that we both had about if we could teach people what we really wanted them to know or what was really helpful or a way to feel better, you know, it was to discover this idea of wholeness that we get to a point in our life where we aren't just trying to get rid of everything negative. We are learning from it. We're growing from it. We're both at the same time already whole and progressing toward wholeness, this idea of wholeness and how there's such a paradox there. And we both were experiencing that. And the people that we knew were experiencing that kind of, just that kind of uh, perplexity, that kind of paradox where these two conflicting kind of things are happening at the same time within our lives. So we worked towards starting a few things. And then by February 1st of 2019, we did, we had planned to, to host our first live event. And our first, our events were going to be a way to get videos into the library. That was our original intent about having events. And so we just began to start having events, starting to gather some experts starting to find where and how and who we were going to 
we were going to have this event. And, and in hindsight, oh my gosh, were we so, <laughs> were we so optimistic? I w- it was quite the journey. But I wanted to kind of share with you some of the amazing things that happened because it was full of amazing things. So one of the most amazing things was I was listening to Super Soul Sunday podcast, I think it was. And Oprah was interviewing a gentleman named William Paul Young. And it spoke to me so deeply. I listened to that podcast three times in one day. I just, there was something there. It was just a spark I felt in my soul listening to him speak. And so I looked him up. I think it was on Facebook. And I just messaged him on Facebook and said, would you be willing to come speak at our event? (laughs) And I don't know how many days went by, but I remember sitting at a restaurant, I think I was at the Olive Garden, and I get this notification that William Paul Young had returned my message. And it was amazing. Uh, And talking to him later, he says, I don't even, I don't ever look at, why in the world was I answering a Facebook message? He says, "I, I don't ever do that. And he was so kind. He came and he spoke with our audience. It was just this total beautiful exchange. And he gave us such the gift to come and be the speaker that day. And if you don't know him, he is the author of the Shack book. And that book was also made into a movie, um, a, a famous motion, motion picture. Part of this journey is one of trust. I I believe that trust is at the core. And um, when you deal with fear in your life, you've got one of two choices, trust or control. And and there is no third option here. And and the issue of fear is a driver. Um, It is love that casts out fear, no doubt about it. It is the awareness and knowledge that I am absolutely loved and that God sees me in terms of the truth of my being, even when I can't. I've learned to live inside the grace of just one day. I've learned to live inside the grace of just one day. And I cannot tell you how powerful this is. Um, uh, John O'Donohue, who just passed away recently, who is a, a poet, says that, the majority of stress is a perverted relationship to time. Okay. And, and, and my word for that is future tripping. Future tripping is the creation of imaginations that don't exist. And then the attempt to control them by spending today's grace on them. So you get grace for one day. Sufficient to the day is the grace thereof. Take no thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough issues of its own. Take captive every empty imagination that raises itself up against the knowing of God. What do I know about God? He's especially fond of me. He's involved in the details of my life. But maybe I don't know that, right? That's why I can't trust that God, right? Because I know that he's, the, he's that dark omni-being behind Jesus who Jesus came to save me from, my tradition, right? So... I have to deal with those lies to move towards a place of trust. But when it gets down to it, it's going to be staying inside the grace of one day and not being a future tripper. You know, future tripping, you know. It's, uh, I think it's a habit of a lot of us, right? We've imagined what? We've lost every job that we've ever had. We've, how about this one? I'm going to say this to her. Then she's going to say this to me. And then I'm going to say this. And our relationship's going to be over. So why even say anything? right? Future tripping. And then, and then, now that we've established that dysfunctional relationship, the next time I see her and she walks in the room and she glances in my direction, I know exactly what she's thinking. I could see it. It's written all over her face, right? And, and and I mean, she may not have actually even seen me, but that's irrelevant. I'm not going to go and ask her what the problem is. I already know what the problem is. So why even have that conversation? See, this is all future-tripping imagination. My kids have been in every major accident and had every disease, (laughs) right? Um, I've been to my own funeral, (laughs) right? And and I was the only one who cried. (laughs) 
piss me off. Yeah? <laughs> but I am absolutely amazed how most of the conversations I have are about people future tripping. And when, you're, when you are a future tripper, which is an attempt to gain control, you know, here's another way to put it. At least when I'm worried, I'm doing something. What are you worried about? Well, what if? If you start any conversation, what if? You're future tripping. You are leaving the present. And by the way, in those, in those imaginations you have, do you, inside those imaginations, do you look around and go like, oh, there's God. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> Hell no. See, <laughs> what you do is God's not in them. So you're on your own. Right? That's why you got to fix it and control it and make sure everybody does what they're supposed to do. And, and you know why God's not in them? Because they're not real. <laughs> they actually don't exist. Right? But we leave the presence where there's joy. And we run into imaginations that don't exist in which we are alone and having to cope with the world the way that we have described it based on our own hurt and damage historically. Control. You know, he's just been one of my mentors that has taught me so many things and I still keep in touch with him every so often and he is the most kind, gentle man. One of those people that, you know, and if you ever learned anything about the stages of, of faith or the stages of growth, he has reached that pinnacle. He is so willing to have love be his motivator at all times. So, so amazing. We also, we wanted to do a panel. So when we were doing the live events, we would have, it was kind of our idea was, our idea was kind of like TED Talk for wellness topics. And we also wanted to have some kind of some discussions where we would have panels and we would just discuss some some of the things that people don't often discuss. And we really wanted to talk about, you know, have at least one panel where we kind of discussed, like I say, something we don't we don't normally do it. So our first episode, our first one in this event was finding wholeness during uh, addiction, you know, because nobody talks about that. What you do when addiction is part of your life or when it's part of a loved one's life, how do you find wholeness? Because we often think that there's no way we can get to a place of feeling whole or feeling complete or feeling rest or calm when addiction is involved. And yet we, we for our own well-being, we have to find some way. So we wanted to have a discussion about that. And we wanted to have a discussion about other difficult things. First of all, what I'd have to say is that it is being with a, an addict, it is the deepest, darkest place you'll ever be. But he's become a blessing to me. And the road that he has taken us on. We have our ups and downs. And the best thing um, that I finally realized is that we go down in that hell hole with him. And I'm pulling. And I'm struggling to pull him up because he's my baby. And I found out that's not the answer. The answer is that I had to climb out and take care of myself. And then I had to show up. And by showing up, I mean, I see myself standing next to him and seeing the glorious person he truly is. Probably the root addiction that I had was to a false self. Um, and what I mean by that is that, and, I, and to use the, since a lot of you are familiar with the shack, the shack is the house on the inside, it's the human soul, it's the house that people helped you build. And a lot of us, we didn't get good help. And that's where I stored all my addictions and hid all my secrets and, and never wanted anybody to come in there. Um, and um, built the facade, that's the, here's where the addiction to the false self comes in. You build a facade outside the shack, outside your own heart and soul, 
that you can paint as fast as you can pick up people's expectations. So you're not living from the inside out, you're living from the outside in. At our next event, we discussed abuse. What do you do when that's been part of your life? How do you find wholeness? And um, one of the panel discussions we wanted to have was we wanted to talk about music. We wanted to talk about how music is healing. And we reached out to a man named Nacho Aramani. Um, Robin had seen him perform at a photography conference she had gone to. And we just happened to reach out to him and had a conversation. And he said, yeah, I'd be happy to fly to Salt Lake City and speak. And it was just really, you know, it was just amazing. So because we had him on the panel or had him coming and speaking, we needed to, we wanted to have a panel where we could talk about um, music so that he could participate on that. So we decided we would have a panel about the healing properties of music. And Robin says, you know, I'd really love to get Alex Boyer on there because he had a song that we wanted to really promote that really emphasized and spoke to those who were uh, contemplating taking their life. And we wanted to kind of add some momentum to that if we could. We wanted his voice to be there, that how his music was hel helping and healing people because he was telling them to stay, to be here. So one of our advisory board members, we just kind of said, hey, could you figure out how we could get a hold of Alex Boyer? And within a few days, we get a text and there's his information. So we reached out and again, didn't think anything of it. And then we're sitting there working one day and all of a sudden it pops up. How did I miss this? I totally want to be there. Here's where we figure this out. I want to be there. And he had other things to do, but he made his way there and if you've ever seen that amazing moment in time where he stands up and he has his hands to the sky and teaching a concept about, about looking at the glory of who you are and how we get so mesmerized by the beautiful sunset or the majestic mountains. And he wants to say, that's you. You are that. You are just as majestic. It was a beautiful moment in that conversation. I was on a retreat. This was this weekend. Okay, last weekend just gone. I was in a retreat in Zion's National Park, okay? This wonderful lady here was with me, Chantel. We had some amazing experiences. 122 people turned up, and it was just a retreat about just helping to find themselves. I went for that too, all right? And then the teacher, he started picking on me, saying, Alex, tell him your story. Tell him when you was homeless. Tell him when this happened to you. Tell him when that happened to you. And then so he said, we went out into the mountains, Zion National Park, it's the three patriarchs. It's three huge, I don't know if any of you guys see it, three just huge, beautiful mountains. And I remember he asked me to tell people something about that that might help in some way people know who they find out who they really are the only thing that came to me i looked at that and i said look at those mountains everyone we have them right here right we can go outside look at those mountains and rate it one to ten what would you give it oh, 10, oh, ten, ten. No, like no there's just no you know ten definitely ten i said now look at yourself and rate yourself one to ten what would you give yourself why are you hesitating you're flipping ten <laughs> If you not, here's the thing, right? If you gave yourself anything less than a 10, you've forgotten who you are. Because the same person that made those rocks, those beautiful grand incredible rocks, is the same person that made you, 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 and us, us. And guess what? He reserved us to the last. We are the crowning creation of all the beauty. You can go out and talk about the wither and the water and how amazing it looks, but you've got to start looking at yourself. And saying, oh my giddy aunt, I may, I'm a 10 also. And then so I had all these women, I love what you said. I had these women stand up and I said, I want you to stand and look at the mountains and stand, put your hands up in here and say, I am the queen of the world. <laughs> Can I tell you how many of those women were afraid to say that? And they'd say in their, in their, in their you know, their little child's voice. I'm the queen of the... No! That's me. You don't mean it. Say it again. I'm the queen. No! And then finally, this woman, she was so shy, timid, never looked at anyone. Right, Chantel? And she stood and she was like, I'm the king... Qu no, queen, sorry. <laughs> of the world! And everyone started clapping, even the tourists that was walking past. <laughs> they, 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 were, they were empowered by seeing the transformation in her. And so that's what I'm saying. Every single one of us, when we start realizing we're a 10... The power that we have in our community, 
amongst our friends, in our family, in the world is powerful. And yes, you will be dangerous. All of these conversations you can watch, they are all in part of the library. Totally worth it to see these speakers and these panels. So amazing, so uplifting. We had such beautiful uh, people come to us afterwards, and it was just a magical day. It was an all-day event. We we had Michelle Powers, Jeff Olson, um, Jeff O'Driscoll. I mean, we had amazing best-selling authors. It was just one of those magic moments. In fact, afterwards, we struggled a little bit, to be honest. It took us some time to get our footings because it was so amazing. It was so beyond what we anticipated that we had to kind of figure out if we were worthy of that kind of great experience. You know, it, it felt beyond me. I, I was there and I helped create it and I get to take ownership of it. But it was a moment of like, wow, I don't know. You know, it was a worthiness moment. Like, am I, is this how big I am? I had to had to look at that for a minute. It brought some self introspection. It brought some opportunities for me to seek more wholeness. And uh, another funny story is about the wholeness network is as we were getting ready for this event and just kind of figuring out what was going on, I was doing a podcast. We were, we had started the podcast and did just a couple of episodes and I happened to reach out to, I happened to notice that coming to town was Eben Alexander. He wrote the book, Proof of Heaven, Proof of Heaven. And it it's just, I hadn't read it even at this point, but I, I knew about it. I'd seen interviews again, I think with Oprah. And I reached out to, to him and said, hey, would you be on our podcast when you're in town? You know, would you mind letting us interview you for a podcast? And again, just a couple days go by and I get a response. Sure, we'll be part of your podcast. And we were going to video it. We were going to video record it, not just audio record it. And and we were so excited. It was just one of those, another win, right? It was just another, wow, this is so amazing. And we were trying to figure out where to film, where to to give him you know, a space that we could put up some cameras and, you know, we didn't know we'd have an, where we could find a place that had enough room that was close by where he was speaking so that we weren't wasting time moving from one place to another. And about the week before he was coming into town, Robin happened to be down in Salt Lake and just came out of a, a mall, looked across the street and said, I wonder if there's something in there and walked into this museum and they said, yeah, we happen to have this and this and this. And we ended up having our first live event there. They had an auditorium and it was so perfect and so amazing for what we were trying to accomplish that day. And and, I, and then that week I found a copy of the book, Proof of Heaven, that my mom had given me. And I remembered that she'd given me this copy and she said, oh, you got to read this book. And then when you're done, pass it on to your siblings and let everybody read it. And I didn't, I kept it and she had passed away. And so I pulled this book out. And if you watch the video of it, I show him this book and like the cover's torn and she writes in every margin, I swear. It's just completely used and abused this book, but it really was special to me. And as we were sitting there talking with him, I realized that we were recording just days to the anniversary of, of her death. And it was just an interesting thing to have that conversation with him because he, you know, um, confirmed to me that this was no accident, that these things falling into place were very much, she was very much part of that experience. Part of the, the issue is uh, that those realms can be uh, have their own rules, there are different ways that we know things, you don't, like in this world, we see with our eyes, we direct our attention to different things, we hear with the ears, and in those worlds, there's no such filtering mechanism, there's nothing that limits it. Right. And so our, our contact with consciousness and with the realm of information 
uh, is wide open. It's kind of like drinking through a fire hose. So uh, it's one of the reasons why I think putting those experiences into our earthly language, mm -hmm. which is very good for describing a trip to Disney World, uh, doesn't necessarily suit those kind of journeys. Uh, it's one reason I love talking with other near-death experiencers, for example, like the IONS meeting. Uh, it's just that so much more of the communication occurs than just the words. Yeah. So a lot of it is kind of heartfelt, emotional, uh, kind of empathy, uh, resonance of information. Um, so it's really just a much broader and bigger category of communication than we're used to. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, Karen and Newell and I in our most recent book, Living in a Mindful Universe, go into deep detail about meditation and about sound enhanced meditation. Because we figure everyone can get there as a conscious being. And that's really the answer to lie within us all. So that's really the best uh, teacher. Several of the first episodes of the Wholeness Network podcast are they're from our live events. You can listen to their words if you go back to the first episodes. That's their talks, the different talks from the different experts, and they are amazing. But the videos are even better. I really recommend going to the videos. And, you know, as we moved forward, we kind of, the, the podcast kind of just was kind of in the background as the, the events became center stage, trying to get the people, trying to balance, you know, putting the money forward to, for all the events and for getting people there and all this stuff, and then needing to make sure that you sold enough tickets and those kind of things to pay for the cost of the event. It was kind of all consuming. So the podcast kind of moved into the back burner as we became an event. Every six months, we were going to have an event and it took about six months to, to be able to, to put that on. It was just all consuming. That's what we did all the time, trying to find speakers and coming up with topics. And oh, it was a lot and it was good and scary and hard. And and I was still coming off of, am I, is this who I am? Can I do this? Because I was just, a, you know, I was just at that point, I hadn't really, I started to see clients a little bit, but I, I was just a, you know, I just was a regular. I felt like just anybody else could do this. I didn't feel like I was anything special. And so when such a special experience resulted because of the things I did and and the magic of that day, it was just, it took a moment, it took some time. And so we worked and had another event in that August of that same year, really good, really amazing experiences. We had Deborah Bonner and her choir came and performed for us at that event. And it was, it was just an amazing time. People again, flying in from around the country and and I, I was able to speak. I did my own speaking engagement there and dared to dared myself to do that. And so did Robin. And then we started uh, planning for April of 2020. And we secured the place and had where we were, we, I think we had all of our uh, guests booked and everything when the pandemic hit. And it was a strange time because you know, it's so hard. Hindsight's so different because back then we were like, I don't know, are they going to make us, you know? So I think at the, it took a while before we canceled. I kind of knew we were going to cancel ahead of time. Uh, I had this feeling, but it took some time before we knew it was going to be impossible for us to have that event. So we canceled that event and we kind of started at square one. What do we do now with the Wholeness Network? What is the Wholeness Network? And it was a kind of a difficult time. We we didn't know how long this would last or, you know, and, and in our beginning, when we really discussed what the Wholeness Network was, it was a network. Our goal is um, still to be uh, a platform, a streaming platform where we would have a, a library of content, a library of content that was the plan. And that's the events were about getting uh, content for the library, the having the experts was about getting content for the library or and and at that point we were going to do some you know online classes help help them create online ca classes so we we're almost going to be like a publishing company and when the pandemic hit it just kind of reset that like what are we going to do how are we going to do this because we were spending so much time on the events that it was really difficult to do other content we were we started a youtube channel and started to just create our own con 
content because we were small enough. We didn't have a studio to necessarily film, film, you know, the, the experts. And it's so weird, but like online stuff was still so new that even the experts were like, I don't know what you're talking about. They were still one-on-one was what they were used to, or they would have an event and they would speak, but they didn't understand how you could teach a concept through an online class and that people would pay for that. It just still wasn't a thing. We could not get our experts on board you know, we were pulling teeth to get them to say, hey, build an online course, build an online course. It's kind of funny now, but it it really was. So we ended up just kind of making a lot of the content ourselves um, to give them some ideas. And then the pandemic lingered and it lingered. And I would have interviews with people every so one, every once in a while, you know, I'd get guests on every, every once in a while and I would do some of my own. But it wasn't until... The beginning of 2022, that I myself said, okay, the podcast is mine because it was kind of my idea and I really loved it and I saw the potential of it. So in January of 2022, I made a commitment that I was going to release twice a month or every other week I was going to release a podcast. And so I started out by that year, I think I started out with the you know, a book review, I should say, of The Fifth Agreement. So good. Some of those episodes are our highest rated episodes. So go back to those episodes. It's The Fifth Agreement. So that book, I'm telling you, it's so good. Everybody needs to read it. The Four Agreements is a great book. I love The Four Agreements. That's the famous one. But that Fifth Agreement is so powerful. And I think so relevant to our lives today, to what's happening, to our problems of today even. So go back and listen to that fifth agreement and better yet, read it and let me know what you think about the book. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Over the course of the podcast, I just wanted to high five some of our amazing guests, some of the ones that have just been those, the highlights, right? The one, some of our popular episodes. Number one was Janice Webb. Janice Webb, so good. The book Running on Empty, it was life changing to me and my family, life changing to understand the need for humans, especially little kids to have emotional reflection, emotional support, to even understand what that was. And she's famous for coining the phrase CEN or child emotional neglect seeing how that can impact people's lives. That is a, seeing how that's just as much of a trauma as some of these major traumas we think about. This emotional neglect is, uh, in childhood, can wire the brain differently. All across the board, I had been hearing from different people, each of which used different words, but they were essentially expressing that feeling like something was missing inside of them. Some of them said they felt numb. Some people said they felt um, empty. Uh, Some people said they felt like something was missing in them that other people had. So there were all different kinds of words that people used. But along with that came this general sense of lack of fulfillment, um, a feeling like uh, there other people are living this full life and I'm just like, they're living in color and I'm in black and white. What's going on here. And um, that's what I kept seeing over and over again. And also in people who claimed that they had a pretty good childhood, a lot of them, not all of them, of course, but, uh, and that was really puzzling because their childhood, you know, how therapists, we therapists, we look in the childhood for explanations for things. And um, many of them, it was hard to find. And a lot of them had been to therapists before who tried to help them find some kind of trauma or abuse that could explain why they were struggling so much as adults and couldn't find any. Um, So that was when I started to think maybe the issue is not something that happened to them when they were growing up, but something that failed to happen for them when they were growing up. Mm. And that was having their emotional, their emotions seen and heard and validated. And what I was realizing was you can grow up in the most 
materially comfortable, loving household, but if your parents um, avoid or fail to notice or don't validate your feelings, it will leave a mark on you. That interview was like just such a privilege because I, it was, it just changed the dynamics of my family understanding the concepts that she taught. And she was so great to explain some things. And I just love her and appreciated her coming on and sharing like her amazing knowledge, just her amazing, amazing research and knowledge. We were also able to to talk to Anna Runkle. And if you don't know who Anna Runkle is, you will. She is just finishing up a couple of books for Hay House. She's just skyrocketing. But when I knew her, she was, I mean, she was doing great, but she is skyrocketing. And she herself doesn't have any credentials. She'll tell you that, but she experienced uh, CPTSD. And so she has a YouTube channel where she talks all about CPTSD and she does such a good job. She, she walks such a, a fine line between educating and empathizing. She's just an amazing human being. What I learned is that a lot of people who are dysregulated now there's, I, I think there's roughly two camps. This is somewhat a matter of opinion, but I don't think it's too far out there. But people who get dysregulated, and you know you're dysregulated when you're feeling kind of discombobulated, you lose your train of thought like I just did a minute ago, <laughs> just sort of like trails off. It happens to everybody. But, you know, with PTSD, you could just be like really not able to function with it. Um, getting numb in your fingers or emotions get way too big or uh, flat. Mm -hmm. So there's some key signs of dysregulation. So those of us who do it what we respond to with treatment, it's seldom talking about what happened in the past. That's the old model. You know, mm -hmm. well, what happened? And let's talk about your parents for several weeks or months or years. Mm -hmm. So that thing, that didn't work for me. That made me more dysregulated and more sad and feel hopeless and feel like something was wrong with me that everybody else thinks this is like so great, but it's not helping me. Some people really respond to a body approach like um, yoga or stretching or marching or dancing, mm -hmm. dan line dancing, square dancing. There's all these forms of dancing when you're doing it with anything physical that you're doing where you're focusing on the left side and the right side. Focusing on the left side and right side amplifies the effect. Doing it with other people amplifies it still further. Mm -hmm. So we start finding out like people must have known about trauma for millennia. Mm -hmm. millennia, right? Mm -hmm. they, they Maybe they didn't know, but they just noticed that they felt better when they dance. Also singing together. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard because we're recording this during COVID and it's dancing together and singing together are right. things that are sort of like not easy to make happen. So a lot of people's symptoms are getting worse. But um, so some people are very physical with that. Some people, and I would be more in this camp, we're all a little of both, but it seems like we sort of favor one or the other. It's a little bit more language. And so I call it hamsters. Mm -hmm. So when I'm dysregulated, my, my negative thoughts are going like hamsters on a wheel in my mind. And I'm just like, you know, if you could hear my thoughts, actually, sometimes you can. <laughs> <laughs> I start talking to myself and I'm like, oh, blah, 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 blah. my kids are like, mom, you know, yeah. <laughs> you're talking to yourself like, oh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> out of my mouth. But that's what it is. I'm having fearful and resentful thoughts mm -hmm. that you know, oh, fear they don't like me and fear I'm not, not good enough. And sometimes it comes out as trivial stuff. Fear we're going to run out of forks at the dinner and, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it yeah, could be really bad stuff. it could be big stuff. Fear the world's coming to an end and mm -hmm. whatever it is, it's stopping me from being present mm -hmm. and being able to reflect love and energy that, that comes through me naturally by being mm -hmm. alive. So so I'm more of a languagey person and the techniques that I teach have a little of both. There's two parts. The first part is writing fears and resentments on paper and asking for them to be removed. Now I don't recommend to people just like, don't just take what I just said and do anything because a lot of us were taught and conditioned to journal. This is not a journal. Mm -hmm. Journals have their place, and, but a journal's purpose is to record and remember what happened. You might want to revisit that memory you might want to look for patterns in it. This is a totally different thing. The spirit of writing your fears and resentments is more like pulling wet leaves off your windshield. 
<laughs> or sweeping just like old hair off the floor. It's just junk. Mm -hmm. You don't need it. You don't need to look at every piece of it. You just need to get it out of there. So that's, that's what the daily practice writing is about. It's you writing fears and resentments and it's just this random stuff that gets on there. And it's, sometimes it's trivial and sometimes it's very serious, but it's all just stuff that goes on the paper. Then it's followed by meditation. On my website, I teach something that's not even that. It's just <laughs> close your eyes for 20 minutes. I mean, I just wanted to give people something they could do right now and not have to go get a teacher. Mm -hmm. But still, if people like meditation, I highly recommend getting a teacher in what you're trying to learn. But I just teach them, you sit down and you close your eyes for 20 minutes and you use a word like, okay, or this, just to kind of hold your focus from going completely all over the place, like chickens, you know, mm -hmm. but you're not, you don't have to like control your thoughts or you focus on your breath or sit up straight or anything, which is very good for people like me. It's got to be easy. You can do it while breastfeeding. You can do it while in the hospital. You can do it in your car, mm -hmm. not while driving. You got to pull over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited that she's going to be back. I've talked to her recently. It was so great connecting with her again. We're friends on Facebook and we, you know, every once in a while you get that little heart from each other and you just, it's so meaningful to me, but I reached out and she was so excited. She says, let me finish off these books and then let's, let's do, let's speak again. So I'm so excited for her. Love it. I loved, Robin said, I just read this amazing book called The Go-Giver. It was just so amazing. It was so different, a different way of looking at business. And oh, it just fed my soul. And I said, and so I read it and loved it, reached out to the author, Bob Berg. And he said, sure, I'll be on your podcast. So we interviewed him. And that was so amazing to get his insight and to be able to connect with him. Um, amazing, amazing like life changing to sit down with Brian McLaren. What a gift. I mean, immediately start to get emotional when I think about that experience. It was just so healing for me to be in his presence. And if you've met him or if you've listened to him, you know what I'm talking about. He just is the, a mountain of compassion and kindness and acceptance. To, to present it very briefly, simplicity is uh, dualism. We learn to sort the world into us, them, good, bad, right, wrong, safe, dangerous, poison, edible, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, familiar, weird, you know, like, dislike, which is necessary for our survival. Um, uh, but, and, and a lot of people stay there their whole lives. Yeah. You know, they, in a certain sense, reach that at age eight or 10, mm -hmm. and they spend the rest of their lives yep. liking and disliking and hating and loving and <laughs> uh, judging and accepting and all the rest. Um, uh, which I, I guess maybe they never have any pain that drives them out of right, that or, right. or experience that does. Um, a, a lot of people move into complexity where you say, hold it, I was taught that people of my uh, political party were good and people of their political party are bad but yeah. this guy in our party is a jerk and that guy in their party is really nice <laughs> and so suddenly the world is complexified yes. and some of the complexity is learning how to explain those things away yeah. and then how to make allowances and exceptions the way i say it is we all get this dualistic contract yeah. and then we start adding fine print <laughs> And, and isn't that pain? it's a it's a it's a painful experience sometimes. <laughs> That's true. It's like another one, another bias. We can talk about that. Another <laughs> bias I'm hitting up against. Ah. Yeah, and so and that's very complex, and it's also yeah. exciting, right? You know, right. Um, exciting like a roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like a challenge. You yes. Know? Um, and we can feel like we're good soldiers because any argument that comes against our group, no matter how hard, we'll find a way to refute it. Right. You know? Right. Right. Um, and a lot of people stay there at stage two complexity their, their whole lives. Um, and then I think more and more of us at a younger and younger mm -hmm. age hit that heartache mm -hmm. that pushes us into perplexity mm -hmm. where we, we, you could say that simplicity is dualistic. Complexity is pragmatic. Mm -hmm. How do I make this work? How right. do I succeed? Right. Uh, and then I think what happens in perplexity is we say, you know what? My group, we think we're right. That group, they think they're yeah. right. That, Gosh, we're all kind of just living in our little bubbles, and we become critical of everybody, mm -hmm. including ourselves. So you could say that 
perplexity is critical. It's mm -hmm. about critical thinking. Yeah. You could also say it becomes skeptical and relativistic, meaning everybody's just, yeah, they're working in their own story. Right. And, um, uh, and the problem for that, uh, I think it's exciting. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like to say to people, stage three is graduate school. Because, <laughs> and when you think about it, when you're an undergraduate, you read textbooks mm. that make it sound like right. everybody in our field agrees. Yes. You get to graduate school, you read the original sources, and you find out that there's arguments in your profession right. and field. And um, So I remember when I was in graduate school and I learned, I was a lit major. Yeah. Some people don't think Shakespeare existed. What? what? You know? and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but then you find out there's all kinds of right. reasons why that is. Right. Um, but the problem for religious people is that there are very, very, very few religious communities mm -hmm. that make room for people in stage mm -hmm. three. Mm -hmm. They tell them there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. And then I think a lot of people stay there their whole lives. But I think more and more people at a younger and younger age yep. are moving into what I call stage four, harmony or solidarity, mm -hmm. where they say, you know what? The stage one people, that's just where they are. And right. the stage two people. And the stage, when I've been in stage three, that's where I'm. I want to get to a place where I don't just have to criticize everybody for being mm -hmm. hypocrites or whatever. I, I have to develop some compassion yeah. for everybody, include, including myself. Right. It was so wonderful. I even, when I did my 2023 vision board that I'm looking at right now, there's a little picture in the corner of Brian McLaren and it says, connect with Brian McLaren again. That was on my vision board and we are going to be recording a podcast in November. So look for that in either December or maybe even January, depending on how we want to release. So I'm so grateful for that. So go back and listen to him. He is just a gift. People like him. They're just a gift. They just love people where they're at. And it's a it's a trait I just honor and adore in people and hope to make part of my wholeness for the rest of my life. Coming soon, we also were working toward, if you know who Carol Tuttle is, she, we're working with her people to get a, a time set up for her to come be on the podcast. There's just amazing things going on on the podcast. So it feels like even though we are at 100, episode 100, it's just beginning. And I'm thankful for all the listeners. Please reach out with topics you want to talk about. Ask questions. The simplest question you can email info at thewholenessnetwork.com or michelle at thewholenessnetwork.com. And the simplest question can give me a, a huge idea for a podcast episode. And please, please rate and review this podcast. I need your support. Your ratings and reviews are the thing that gets people to listen more and helps me out, helps the network out so much because our goal is just to learn about all different kinds of ways that we can uh, add to our wholeness. And some are not going to speak to you and some they're going to be a lifeline for others. And that's almost the goal is we just want to explore, ask questions, be curious, allow people to have their journeys, be brave enough in our own journey and claim that wholeness. At the end of every episode, I ask people to think about what is wholeness to them. What does wholeness mean to you? And to me, if I ask myself that question, it's just one of the most glorious words and concepts I can even imagine. Because if we're chasing that enoughness, it just feels like it's always out of reach until we start to comprehend the idea of wholeness. That without accepting, without this part of me, if I want to get rid of this part of me, then I am also, you know, I'm not whole. I'm not, that's like by very definition of the word, I'm not whole if I refuse to accept this part of me. Now, does that mean that I don't want to get better or I don't want to expand or that maybe even I don't, I have certain feelings about pieces of myself. I might have shame or discomfort with parts of myself that, that maybe need to expand and grow, but it doesn't work. It doesn't help to live in that resistance. Once we accept who we are, what's really going on, the wholeness of our experience, then we have the momentum, then we have the possibility, then we have the ability to, to shift, to change, 
to be different, but we have to hold what is true. We have to know what is true and let what is true and what is exist. And that's wholeness to me. Feel empowered every day with wholeness videos, meditations, downloads, classes, and more by joining the Wholeness Library at thewholenessnetwork.com.